Good morning. Welcome to Google I.O. It's a beautiful day. I think warmer than last year. And welcome to this Nexus special, episode 58, where we will indeed be covering Google I.O. 2018 on May 8th, 2018. And now, those who can't, teach. This next special is hosted by Ian R. Buck and Betsy Dadabo. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash ns58. All right, Betsy, it's that time of year again. Android I.O. No, <laughs> Google I.O. I messed up already. It's okay. Google can't even like keep track of whether they want to call things Google or Android these days. It's true. They're, uh, they're constantly, constantly changing um, the, the branding behind things. Like, um, I think the most recent example that I can think of would be uh, Android Pay. Nope, Google Pay. Nope, Google Wallet. Wait, I've, uh, I've forgotten what it's called already. Google Pay now, but I think... Yeah. Yeah, they're both called Google Pay. One of them's called Google Pay Send. Right. And they used to be Google Wallet and Android Pay. Pay. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, man. So, Google I.O., uh, Google's big like developer conference but of course as with all these developer conferences they always have a keynote right at the beginning for all of us consumers out there who are enthusiastic about what they have to uh to sell to us and um so that was at uh well it was at noon today central time the one true time zone and um Leading up to this, uh, our good friend Ryan, who normally would be on uh, on a Google episode, but uh, was busy with other work things today, um, he posted on Twitter that he's looking forward to this, but he had some questions. Will Google have answers for those hoping for more privacy? Which is always a question. Uh, will Google have answers to, to so what OS? And I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to that like with that but I, I think it might be like Chrome OS and Android were supposed to have a merger but then they sort of didn't so I'm not sure yeah uh, will Google have answers to questions period <laughs> and will Google deprecate an answer only to make another answer that misses the point uh, which is I think it's at the heart of uh, Google's messaging strategy for sure um, but a lot of the other things that they've done that uh, you know they've got things that should connect well but sometimes miss each other in really obvious ways um one kind of before we even start the news one one thing that i noticed during the keynote was that pretty much every person who was out there presenting uh was wearing a big giant you know wear os watch formerly known as android wear <laughs> Um, and so I kept waiting for them to like talk about you know some new version of Wear OS that that you know with new capabilities and stuff, but they never did. Wear OS did not come up, um, so that was uh, an interesting omission. I think the watches were just like, hey, it still exists. Yeah. FYI. Yeah. And like it was like they they went to some real lengths to show them off. Like this one guy had long sleeves on, but then like it was conveniently tucked. You know that that cuff was tucked underneath his watch so that we could all see his watch. Well, possibly just because they're so ginormous still. <laughs> yeah. That it would look awkward any other way. Yeah, you could you can't button your uh, your long sleeve shirt. It's no pebble. Without yeah no. Um, speaking of that, actually, pretty soon I'll have a review of uh, the Fitbit Versa uh, on Second Opinion, because uh, Savannah got one, and I'm very eager to compare what, what Fitbit is up to these days since they, you know, bought the Pebble team. Um, but we're not here to talk about that, we're here to talk about Google. So. Of course, they started off talking about AI because for at least the last three years, like Google's entire MO has just been AI. It's going to change the world, right? And Sundar Pichai, of course, talked about a few specific ways that AI is being used. Um, I really liked the healthcare example that they gave. Um, I, I feel like I've seen that example somewhere before. I don't remember if they brought it up last year or if I just like read about it on the Google blog. But um, yeah, they talked about using machine learning to detect like stuff in a retinal scan and like specific like 
I don't remember what the retinal scans are, were originally intended to be for, like what they're supposed to detect. It was people with um, early, early onset for people with diabetes who okay. might lose their vision. Okay. So it would be early warning signs. Yeah. But it turns out with the AI could detect many more conditions through the eye and see identifiers like male, female, mm-hmm. age, other things that a human would not be able to looking at the retinal yeah. scans determine. Do they do they bring up like cardiac arrest or something like that yeah. in there? I think so. Something yeah. like that. Um, and that's, yeah, like, I love that example because it's like, it's a non-invasive procedure, right? So like, who's going to be against it? Uh, it's an example of like the machines, like being like learning how to do the thing that we're training them to, but then also like accidentally discovering something new, which is like, you know, a lot of times that can be a problem in machine learning where it's like, oh, I did not, I totally did not mean for this AI to like take this approach to this problem and so now we have to like kind of give it different parameters but in this case it was like it was a it was a happy coincidence um but yeah they they didn't talk about ai on its own for very long because of course ai like works its way into almost everything that google is doing these days so you know it'll come up over and over and over again um they did talk about like new improved tpu chips which is their their hardware for performing like machine learning AI stuff that they you know want developers to use their their infrastructure for it because they can charge the money, um, but that you know was not they didn't go into that in, in a lot of detail. Shall we talk about Android? Of course. Yes, yeah, since that's that's always the big one. Although Google doesn't seem to like Android, I still do so. Okay, what, can you unpack that for me a little <laughs> bit? Saying, I feel like they called things Android because they thought it would be like a winning name that would draw mm. people in. And now they're like, hmm, I guess we didn't really defeat Apple. So right. So let's just generalize it so anyone will join the party. That's right. Yeah, they, they, they did have a period where they kept naming things after Android even though they weren't running on Android necessarily. Yeah, so I guess it makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. If you want someone on iPhone, an iPhone to download Android Pay, it mm-hmm. might not make sense to them. But. Does iOS allow you to use Google other pay? tap to pay? F- yeah, probably well, not. It doesn't seem like something Apple would do. They're pretty into their infrastructure. Yeah. Keeping it. Closed keeping ecosystem. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that would be something to ask an Apple person. Both of us own Pixels, so <laughs> we're pretty outside of that world. Um, all right, so Android P is the next version of Android that's going to be coming out in the fall with whatever the next Pixel phones are. Um, but as usual, the beta is now available. Um, and unusually, it's available on a lot of different devices. So so traditionally, the beta has been like available on whatever Nexus devices are current or now that we're in the Pixel, you know, period of time uh the pixel the current pixel devices um but this year i think i they they said that this was like thanks to the strides that they made in android 8 to make it easier to update android uh i believe that they're referring to project treble there which is my favorite part of android 8 um the the android p beta is available now for pixel devices and for phones from seven other manufacturers and they flashed a bunch of logos up there and i did not have time to take a look at all of them and see what they were um but that's very exciting and um and unlike the old days it's very easy to go and install the beta you know you used to have to like flash the rom onto your phone and everything um, but these days there's just a website that you go to google.com slash android slash beta and uh and then you like as long as you're logged into the same google account as you're logged in on your phone you just click like enroll this phone in the beta and then it gets an update yes and i i don't usually read this fine print but i did in this case to see what problems they're encountering this one <laughs> and one of the scariest warnings is system map performance is periodically known to be slow and janky. And yes, that is a quote from their website. So use at your own risk. <laughs> and I love I love that because you don't expect, you know, a big company like Google to put something kind of goofy sounding like that 
in their you know in their like update notes you know i would expect to see that kind of thing from like pocket casts <laughs> maybe uh because they always have fun with their their um release notes so the new features in android p that they have uh previewed for us um the first one that they talked about was adaptive battery uh and i was i was when they started talking about battery stuff i was like wait a minute like didn't you guys already solve this problem twice before, you know, with like the, the doze and then like the deep sleep or whatever. Um, but, uh, adaptive battery is meant for a slightly different use case. So it's, it's trying to cut down on like, you know, days where you might have an unusual amount of battery being used for no particular reason that you can tell, right? We all have those days where it's like, oh, wow, like, why am I down to 30% already and it's only 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Um, and the way that it's doing this is it is uh, Android's going to be figuring out which apps you are likely to use in the next few hours in order to... I think they were talking about prioritizing them, but what I think they actually mean is like preventing any other apps from doing like anything, even in the background. Yeah, and how did they figure that out? I forgot the word they kept using. Oh. AI? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah a machine learning i think that's their official phrase oh yeah it's i'm actually not sure if they mean something different between between machine learning and ai yeah because I, I i feel like machine learning is kind of a like a, if we drew a venn diagram of it machine learning would just be inside of ai yeah, it's using ai to or it's it's one itself. it's one version of ai yeah um another adaptive feature that they talked about is adaptive brightness which i think is a confusing name because don't we already call adaptive brightness like isn't that the setting where it automatically adjusts yes based on uh, based on what the lighting is yeah. yeah apparently they're calling this new version adaptive brightness as well but i think it's because when you adjust it it learns if you manually adjust it at different mm -hmm. brightnesses mm -hmm. it will just slowly change so it's not adjusting maybe as much when it's a certain brightness out yeah yeah because like the the adaptive brightnesses that are built into phones currently are kind of based on what the manufacturer thought would be you know a right. reasonable brightness for this lighting you know and and based on like you know what you had like the the dimmer set to Right. when you hit the button um but it like not everybody is going to have the same preferences for each lighting condition so that's like it's it's more i would almost call it personalized brightness instead yeah. of adaptive brightness i think it's machine learning brightness <laughs> <laughs> yeah now this next one actually doesn't use machine learning i think nope wait it, nope, does. it does dang it <laughs> <laughs> So they talked about app actions, which is um, by itself doesn't really use machine learning. It's just, you know, an, a, a new API for developers to be able to kind of tell Android that, like, here are some actions that somebody could perform in my app. Right. So maybe like in actually this this reminds me a lot of like shortcut widgets kind of thing, you know, where you can put them onto the home screen you know if you like want to be able to tap on one button to open up google maps and have it start navigating you to a particular place was this the slices you know? thing yes yeah okay um and it's yeah so it's called app actions in some places and it's called slices in other places uh i think like they called it slices when it appeared in a google search right yeah or on the not google now screen whatever that is the all apps screen no maybe in the assistant <laughs> yes the that, <laughs> that's the one um but yeah so so like it'll it'll be showing up in several different places and those that's where like machine learning comes into it because android will be trying to predict like what action you might want to do like in... if you say you want to order a pizza and it regularly knows that you have a domino's app mm -hmm. a slice of that would come up that would allow you to order the pizza directly from the search a slice of pizza will come up a slice for a slice <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and of course like as soon as these kinds of features are announced i start thinking about like oh man what like what kinds of app actions are the apps that i already use you know going to start building in and how is this going to apply to my life and you know and then i remember that like 
oh, half of the apps on my phone are from like developers who aren't going to be updating their apps to you know take advantage of new stuff. So that's sad. Oh well. Uh, ML Kit definitely uses machine learning. Machine learning. <laughs> it's it named is. after it. Um, and this is uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. ML Kit. Kit. That's an Apple like ML- MLK. Oh no, no. I'm thinking of the just the word kit after something is like that's a very Apple thing. You know, yeah. you've you've got um, Web Kit and Home Kit and other kits. This is this is the extent of my Apple knowledge here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they like it's basically a set of M- APIs uh, that's available through Firebase, uh, which is like Google's developer infrastructure thingy that people can take advantage of. Yeah. I think. Um, Ryan and Brian and Brandon are probably like rolling their eyes at me now because uh, I have a computer science degree, but I don't do programming. Um, so basically, it's just going to make Those it. Those who can't do teach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have thought of that on occasion. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, it's going to make it easier for app developers to just like build in cool features like being able to recognize objects in pictures or, you know, like other common stuff that machine learning is used for. Um, And so because like Google has developed all these, all these things, they can just, you know, hand that off to developers to, you know, like make that available in many, many different apps, which I think is a very good thing. I wonder, hmm, is Firebase available for iOS as well? I don't know. Good question. Because Google has been doing quite a few things that are like available cross platform you know like i know that game developers if they did so desire they could make a game that uses the google play like achievement system and stuff on both android and ios Hmm. but of course nobody does because like why would you yeah and because i mean even on apple side of things like hardly anybody who's playing games uses game center so because why would you yeah i don't know i do you uh, I definitely use the Google Play. Yeah, I, I, and I, I mean, back when I played games, I don't play games anymore because I don't have time because I make too many podcasts. Uh, but I used to like very, very meticulously look at what achievements my friends were getting and oh. like how we compared and stuff. And they yeah, seem so arbitrary. I just never looked into that. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. Like the amount of experience right. points that are, yeah, yeah, because that's just set by like whoever made the game. Right, and so. so- you could get 10,000 experience points for playing Bejeweled. And... Yeah. I should just make my own game and yeah. give myself, like, max int uh, experience points. Yeah. Um, UI. There's some UI changes in Android. Um, when, when we first started seeing, like, screenshots from Android P, everybody was like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, the home button isn't a button anymore. It's like a little pill. And there aren't any other buttons around it. And, like, are they doing an iPhone 10? you know, kind of gesture thing kind of they kind of are um so the home that 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 home pill is still going to be a home button that brings you to you know your home screen when you tap on it um but then a lot of the other stuff that we used to do especially with like the recents button uh are being replaced with gestures so now if you want to go to your list of recent apps you got to swipe up from that that home bar um you can swipe up again to open the all apps list, which is pretty cool because, like, currently you can only get to the all apps if you're on your home screen, if you're in your launcher, you know. Um, but, you know, now it'll be it'll be uh, accessible from from any app that you're in. Uh, and then you can swipe to the right to, like, quickly scroll through your list of recent apps. So that would be, like, I think that that... that you know, kind of takes the place of like double tapping on the recents button to just like quickly switch between the last two apps that you're using. You know, um, you can just like sw- quickly like swipe to the right kind of thing to like go to the last app that you were that you were using. Um, they didn't talk about the back button, but I noticed that it showed up sometimes and it didn't show up other times. So I think it must be the kind of thing where like if the app that you're currently in has some action that's associated with the back button then it will appear otherwise it will not um which i think actually i think i like that i like that change i do because it's annoying to press it and nothing happens yeah or it's even worse to press it and then it brings you to your launcher 
because it's like, wait a minute. I yeah. just wanted to go back. I right. didn't want to go, go home. Yeah. yeah. Like the home button is for home. The back button should be for back and they shouldn't overlap. Right. Um, but, you know, we'll like we don't know all the details behind that one yet. So we'll see. We'll see if it's reasonable. We'll find out in the fall. Um, I do. I do like the changes that they're making to the volume, the volume slider, because uh, right now it's kind of a it's kind of a meme to like you know the, that problem where like okay i'm gonna tap on a youtube video oh crap wait a minute how high was my media volume i don't remember i need to like turn it down and then you hit the down volume button but because the video hasn't started yet right it changes the ringer volume right your your notification sound volume and then the vo- then the video starts and it's super loud anyway because like you weren't able to change the media volume before it started and so now what happens is um when you hit the volume buttons, by default, it's it's changing the media volume. And you can only change the notification sound volume by tapping on the on-screen button for the notification, you know. Just how you used to with the down arrow to get the rest of the... Mm, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Options. But now, but yeah, the, like the difference is that now... It it's never arbitrary like which one is going to be the one that you're controlling first. It's always going to be the media volume that you're controlling first. Um, and then the other change is where it's appearing on the screen. So in stock Android currently, uh, the volume you know appears as a horizontal bar along the top of the screen, uh, but it's going to in Android P it's going to be a, a vertical bar right next to the volume buttons. So. I think that's probably something that like each phone manufacturer is going to have to like tell Android <laughs> where the volume buttons are because they're in different places on every phone. So, yeah. Oh, and then the auto rotate yeah, change. Can't decide if I like that or not. Yeah, I'm. Basically, the change is instead of it automatically rotating when you rotate your device, it says, "Do you want to rotate your device?" Mm-hmm. You, you basically you move your hand. You want to rotate it. Is that's how I interpreted it? Yeah, because like currently, you have the choice of either allowing your phone to rotate the screen whenever it detects that you have rotated, or you have the option of never having the screen rotate. Mm-hmm. And the default now, and I think this might be the only option now in Android P, is going to be uh, when you rotate the screen, it pops up with a little button in the home bar that if you tap it, then it will toggle between portrait and landscape. Um, I can see that being really nice. Yeah, I mean, I have often switched it to one or the other. Mm -hmm. Like when you're laying in bed or something. I wonder if... I wonder if there will be special cases for, like, like, if I'm in YouTube, right? And in YouTube, like, I always want it to rotate when I rotate the screen because Mm -hmm. I want the video to go to full screen you know what they need what do they need machine learning (laughs) (laughs) they need to apply machine learning to this and then you'll be a happier camper uh i thought you were gonna say an api so that the developers can (laughs) tell google like what's reasonable in their app oh no right machines machine learning it'll solve all our problems yeah because then it'll be like oh he habitually wants this Mm -hmm. so we'll just assume that's true that's true um, and then, oh, here's, oh, yeah. here's the, this last one. Oh, this is going to be contentious. Um, basically they're going to take all of my preferences and throw them out the window here. <laughs> right. We, we know what Ian wants, but we're not going to give it we to Ian. We know what is better for Ian. Exactly. So and it's not entirely wrong. I'll be honest. Oh yeah. No, it, very, very true. Um, so this, this, uh, is a, they call it digital well being. Um, and, they talked about it both during the Android section, but also during a different section. Right. So I think, I think it's kind of goes beyond just Android. Right. Um, because have you ever wondered how many hours of Netflix you've watched? I'm sure you have and not actually wanted to know. <laughs> now it's going to tell you. Man, this is like, um, cause you know, as, as somebody who releases content on YouTube, right. I obsessively look at the analytics for what other people are watching on my channel now I'll be able to obsessively look at the analytics of what I'm watching on everybody else's channels, right. you know, <laughs> and not just on YouTube, but across like everything in in theory. 
Um, so Google's goal here is to try to help people find balance in their lives. And yeah, so they're going to have like a, uh, an entire dashboard that shows you how you're using your time on your electronics, of course, because Google doesn't know what you do with the rest of your time. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It probably does. It probably does. We could. Oh, if they expanded this to like everything, you know. Hey, Ian, I see that you've gone to Dunkin' Donuts again for the third time this week. Don't you think you could you should lay off of all those donuts? I feel like this is a Saturday Night Live commercial in the making (laughs) in which it's going to start recommending things based on like how many cat videos you've watched Mm. and Mm -hmm. chocolate you're eating or whatever and be like. Ian, would you like me to set up an appointment with your therapist? (laughs) (laughs) And then if you don't, a couple weeks later, it's like, Ian, I already called your therapist's office and I made you an appointment for 4 p.m. I'm going to shut off your phone if you don't go. But Google, how will I navigate to it if I don't have my phone? Oh, man. Yeah. So they're... They, they talked a little bit about, like, yeah, we understand that, like, you know, everybody's using their devices to, like, improve their lives, you know, to be, like, the most effective person that they can. But at the same time, like, you know, it's very tempting to use these devices for other stuff that, you know, you maybe maybe you don't want to. And he even, like, talked about... Um, you know what like you come home and you're really tired at the end of the day and you know maybe just watching your favorite tv show like that's going to feel like a good you know use of your time but if you come home and you just like watch a bunch of infomercials then you'll feel like you're wasting your time and i was like what kind of example is that <laughs> <laughs> okay um no where i think this yeah. will actually be useful for me is it i have a habit both morning and night of just laying there and mm-hmm. reading the news mm. or whatever and this helps curb that which um since i used to give you rides and you know how late i was that's usually why <laughs> so hang on betsy you always told me that it was because you had a bunch of ice to scrape off or whatever well that usually would play into it but yeah. it would be like i didn't stop browsing the internet long enough to check the time <laughs> and see that i needed to scrape off the ice yeah yeah um now of course as much as google rules my life they don't control all of the apps that I use, you know. So they are building in, like, ways for developers to surface information from their apps to Google about how you're using their app. Um, so if you were, uh, if you came here with questions about uh, privacy. more privacy, uh, no, no. There are no, there are no opportunities for more privacy here. <laughs> no. Um. And, yeah, I think they they also talked about, I mean, like, I tend not to think about these kinds of things because I don't have kids and I have no plans of ever having kids. But, like, you know, they they talked a lot about these young people who are growing up, you know, surrounded by phones and everything. And how do we teach them to, you know, responsibly. Addictions. Yeah, like like using using electronics with um, moderation, you know. So this was kind of. I don't know exactly how this is going to solve that problem, but I guess it gives parents more tools to... It also gives, you know, children just more things that they have to work around in order to trick the system. It makes them sharper. Yeah, fine. sure. <laughs> yep. Um, now, it does give you a little bit more control in, in a few things. Uh, Android P will let you set, like, time limits for particular apps, like, on an app-by-app basis. Um I don't know if it's going to like suggest time limits for things or if that's like entirely up to you. I don't know. I think I know. the parental feature is you're setting a distinct time limit. Mm-hmm. But I don't know for your own personal use. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, it'd be interesting to like be able to set limits for yourself uh, if you know that you're going to be like out late and, you know, when you're super tired, you aren't yourself and don't have you know, control, yeah. self-control so or, like i mean if you need to be somewhere in 40 minutes oh sure show you're watching it's longer than that you could set it to basically like an alarm clock there you go yeah, yeah um this also ties into a few new like do not disturb features in android um so they have a new a new thing called shush which is like if you set your f- phone down face down as you have on the I, desk yeah. right now, uh, it will default to being in do not disturb mode. Um, That's going to be a problem for me because I almost always have it face down. So. Yeah, yeah. I'll just change my habit. It's fine. 
Yeah, as and it's definitely going to be important for them to communicate that effectively to users because if or I'm let them turn it off. Right. Yeah. But like, if I don't realize that that's a thing, then I might just you know like continue putting my phone face down as I always have, for example, and then like I don't realize that I'm missing notifications because like the notification LED is also on the front of the phone, so I can't even see that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I wish they used machine learning to know that. I would only want that if I was, say, at a restaurant or other things. Oh, yeah. Like, I want to be with my friends right now, so maybe mm-hmm. I want to be in do not disturb mode. Um, they also have wind down mode, which is where... Uh, in order to encourage you to not use your phone quite so much before you go to bed, uh, it will turn on do not just dis- so so you literally tell the phone like this is my goal for going to bed tonight, and then at a some period of time leading up to that, it will turn on do not disturb, and then it will also set the screen to be grayscale, which I think is pretty cool, because um, I have heard that as a kind of a pro tip for like making your apps like taking the power away from your apps for just like like grabbing your attention all the time um because you can still totally use a phone no problem while it's in grayscale it's just that you know you you don't have like these colorful notification you know badges and things popping up that uh you know that'll like draw your attention to them i wonder if um hmm, grayscale would look really interesting in you know, like nighttime mode as well, because right. it's orange shifted. I was wondering about that if they would still do orange shifting, or I should hope so because, like, when a screen is displaying like white, right, it's using a lot of the blue, you know, light from the screen, right. So, and that's what night shift is supposed to cut down on. So, yeah, then it wouldn't really be grayscale; it would be orange scale. Mm, mm-hmm. Maybe we need to. We just need to rename it. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Google's never renamed any products before. Android no, scale, we'll call it. <laughs> and then they'll call it Google scale a year later. So Google Assistant um, definitely came up a lot during this this keynote because um, they, I mean, it frankly it replaced a lot of older things, you know, and kind of unified did it really unify anything though because like it replaced the voice commands that used to be in android you know but didn't have like a personality behind them and now it's replacing google now which was also associated with the voice commands right they were both part of the same app and you know so i i feel like they didn't actually add anything well i feel like the biggest thing with google assistant was its incorporation into third party hardware hardware controlling smart home devices That's, that's very true so the the biggest thing to me was connection to other things. Mm-hmm. To yeah. Try to be an actual assistant, which is I think their next level is to be more like an actual assistant. Yeah, kind of ubiquitous in your life. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest example to me, and the one that I went and was like, guys, this is what Google's doing now, is the fact that it would make calls for you mm-hmm. and set up appointments for you. That's like hiring an assistant. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean. A lot of the other things that that Google services have been doing for me over the years are definitely things that like an assistant would have had to do back in the days of like pen and paper, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, all of my like calendars reminding me when to leave for things Um, like inbox filtering out, you know, like like knowing which uh, messages are the most important that I need to know right away versus like the ones that I can wait until I have a minute to like sit down and go through my entire inbox kind of thing. Um, like those are all very assistant e things, but like this definitely, yeah. So this feature where you can have the Google assistant call a business in order to set up appointments for you, uh, is like, it feels very Turing test Mm -hmm. kind of like situation. And, and I think that's why we're all very like, whoa, that's the future. Um, if it made it that it, so that I never had to talk to CenturyLink customer support, <laughs> then it would be worth it. Yeah. I would pay money for that. <laughs> um, and I really like it because it. I, I feel like we as customers are going to be giving businesses kind of a like a, a taste of their own medicine, you know? Like, I call 
a helpline or whatever, and I have to like talk to a robot for a while before you know who tries to like solve the problem for me. But then I you know I just have to get through that robot before I can get to an actual human kind of thing, and and now I'm just having a robot call them for me. Yeah, I sort of picture it. You know, there was that the Google homes talking to each other. Oh, yeah. And slowly falling in love or whatever. I'm wondering. <laughs> you will have to send me that link because that sounds adorable. <laughs> does anyone ever, I don't know, do they record these and see, like, if the two robots are talking to each other, like, what actually the process is that they go through mm-hmm. to get there? I don't know. It's weird. I think I think my favorite thing about the demos that they played for us was, like, that the Google Assistant inserted a bunch of unnecessary, like, ums and uhs yeah. into what it was saying. And I was like, it sounds just like a person talking on the um, phone. Right. <laughs> it was a little uncanny in that way. Yeah. Now, the name of this feature oh, is really name. awful. It's bad, guys. It's bad. Google Duplex. Mm-hmm. Duplex. What, what connection does that have to calling somebody? I really, I tried to rack my brain for duplex, like side by side. No, two people live. No, it's like, I don't know. Like that's what you would name Google getting into the housing business for some reason. Google duplex. But nope, it's calling people. I don't, uh. I don't know. It confuses me. I mean, this is not a feature that will be coming with your next Android P device. It sounds like it's still. Mm, it's down the road away. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There were other interesting applications of this though yeah um because they were talking about how google could use this robot to update the hours of the google maps app that would say when it's open so they would call and say when are you open for during memorial day and then they would update their hours based on the answer without a person having to physically go and ask or call Mm -hmm. to update that yeah because the local guides there are so many so many times where i go to like you know a small local dairy queen or whatever and i notice that the hours that are posted you know are different than the hours that are in google maps so i go and update that you know because i'm a good citizen good little local guide and uh, i get a little pat on the head from google for that but like you know i still had to physically go down there and notice that there was a problem and then proactively you know like i feel like i'm such a weird person that like i'm i'm part of like the the point one percent of people who would actually go through all of those steps to help google maps to update that you know um so having it automated definitely good application now they of course are making their voices sound much more natural now they they're always constantly improving that um this latest version they call wavenet i guess um i think they've had names for like the previous like types of things that they were doing to make the voices sound natural but i don't remember what they were Um, apparently available today, uh, you can choose one of six voices for your Google Assistant. Uh, I have not gone and played with them, have you? No, I haven't. Hi, I'm your Google Assistant, here to help you throughout your day. Hi, I'm your Google Assistant, here to help you throughout your day. Now, if this was the new Google one, it would say, I'm your Google Assistant, uh, here to help you throughout (laughs) your day. So we know that has not been updated. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. I don't know that for a fact. It's probably not true. They also brought on a celebrity <laughs> who I, I wasn't familiar with who he is. Oh, good Lord. Please tell me about John Legend. Who is this no, man? He's just a, a singer songwriter. Okay. Very famous. You've heard his music. I'm, I'm sure positive. I have. Yeah. Can you name some of it for me? Okay, come on. <laughs> he's married to Chrissy Teigen. <clears throat> who? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't How get can out. you work at a high school and not have heard of some of these people? I don't get out much. Fine, fine. I mean, if you Google him, the top result is now Google is using him as a voice. <laughs> they also talked about uh, Google Assistant being available in more places. So by the end of the year, it'll be available in 30 languages and in 80 countries, uh, which is quite a few. But by no means, all of the languages are all of the countries definitely not no uh but they're getting there they're getting there um and especially since like the the google assistant is such a challenging like application of machine learning that uh yeah it'll take them a while to to 
get it out to a lot of those niche languages. Yeah. So uh, speaking of machine learning, Mm -hmm. another way they've been using it is to try to figure out how to make it better, how to get it to answer your questions better or do kind of more human-like Google Assistant-y things. Mm -hmm. So you can have a continued conversation with it instead of saying, hey, Google, after each sentence, which is not natural. I haven't said, hey, Ian before i talk to you every time be super hey awkward. betsy that is like the best feature the best new improvement i can imagine hey ian i don't know what you're talking about this is super fun i can't i can't do it i can't do it more <laughs> than once i know it's awkward <laughs> which they also picked up on yeah yeah and i understand why that needed to be the case um but if they can if they can figure out how to remove that that necessity without opening up like the google home to having more false positives kind of thing you know of of, like responding to stuff that was not directed at it yeah i'm curious about that because i've often used it to play music Mm -hmm. during dinner of Mm -hmm. which there's many other conversations going on it was like everyone shut up for at least 10 seconds while it shuts off i don't know maybe maybe that's using the same system as what they showed off with the transcription um where they like there were two people who were talking over each other in a video and like i as a human couldn't even understand what either of them were saying that's true but like this transcription automatic transcription service was able to separate out their voices and understand what each one of them was saying so right, that... but how would it know whether or not it pertained to mm. because it's in the next line we were going to talk about how it, you can have multiple actions mm-hmm. unrelated so if you wanted to play music and also I don't know what I'll turn on the lights. It mm-hmm. would be able to parse those two commands at the same time, even though they're unrelated. Right, and I think well, if if it can, if it can tell the difference between two different people talking, then it might just ignore anything that the second person says, right, and only treat what the the person who started the hey hmm uh, yeah. hot word, and then yeah, and continue a conversation with only that person, which is really impressive because like I even have trouble. Uh, paying attention to the people who are talking to me when we're in a noisy room you know like i i I can't filter that out very very well uh oh gosh Uh, i just read the next one pretty please pretty please can we not have this as a feature even if i was a parent which i am also not this would just annoy and if i was a kid man (laughs) this would annoy the hell out of me so so pretty please Basically, it's trying to parent your children mm-hmm. into asking nicely, asking asking Google nicely. I can imagine turning this on as a prank to my roommate. <laughs> yeah. That would be the best case use of it. But yeah, it basically won't do things for, for you unless you say please or it will positively reinforce. Mm-hmm. Oh, you asked so nicely. It and it sounds, sounds, it sounds so condescending when I it know. says that. Oh, gosh. I wanted to punch the screen, to be honest, <laughs> and I'm not even a child. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm really hoping that Pretty Please is going to be an opt-in feature where it's off by default, and then you have to turn it on I in order for it to think appear. That was the way it presented it. Yeah, it's I I don't remember how clear they were about it. They 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 said it was an option, but like. That could still go either way. It could be opt-in or opt-out, you know? I don't know. No. I say no to this feature. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it being widely panned in, in the blogs today. And this actually, this this gets at one of my main problems with, like, these heart smart home devices is that, like, I don't know when there's been an update to it. And so, like, when it starts responding differently to commands, I'm like, oh, great. Now I got to, like re-figure out how to talk to you you know like uh a couple weeks ago like so my morning routine i always like go downstairs into the kitchen as i'm like getting myself some cereal i say like hey good morning and it's like good morning and it gives me like you know the morning update and then it like transitions into a bunch of news you know podcasts and because i have a chromecast in the kitchen that's the default playback device for that google home it's it all of those podcasts come through the speakers right instead of through the google home itself and i used to be able to tell the google home stop actually i would always say thank you because i 
set thank you as a you know uh replacement word for stop because it does feel more polite pretty please (laughs) i'm sure it would really congratulate you for your (laughs) politeness from now on um but yeah like lately whenever i tell it to stop it doesn't stop the cast i don't know what it thinks i'm trying to get it to stop but it like i always have to go to my phone now to stop the cast there's gotta be a different way of doing it there's gotta be but i have not figured it out and because i only do this once a day you know try to shut the hell up (laughs) i don't think it would take that maybe if politeness mode was off (laughs) oh man oh vulgar google home mode (laughs) yeah people would go for that (laughs) uh that'd be a good party trick um smart displays so this is a new new category of hardware uh, that's new to google b- new to google but it's basically exactly like the echo show yeah which was is amazon's version of the echo that has a square screen and they're they're like practically the same size you know they seem to be a, about seven or eight inch screens uh they're designed to sit there on a counter you know kind of thing in a public place uh so you can talk to them to start stuff just like just like the uh, Google Homes, but then it'll also display like information about what you are asking for on the screen. But it definitely looks different than like the assistant interface on the phones, you know? Because like the screens are, are landscape oriented, yeah. not por- portrait oriented. So yeah. Um, and when it's just sitting there, like, you know, biting its own, minding its own business, uh, the kind of screensaver looks just like Chromecast's like kind of screensaver thingy. So I don't know how much of like the DNA it's pulling from all of these different places. Um, important to note that there aren't any first party versions of this. All of them are being made by other hardware manufacturers. And then they just have, you know, this platform that's built by Google on them. Um, which I'm totally fine with because it sounds like Google is entirely in control of like all of the updates and you know every, it's going to be one unified like platform still. Um, but if you're somebody who you know really like only only will do like the first party hardware from Google, then uh, you'll be disappointed with that, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm also I don't know I've struggled. All their examples that they used or most of them were dealing with playing music from google play or assuming Mm -hmm. you had google or youtube red or Mm -hmm. other sort of things so i'm curious on how good it is or how worthwhile it would be if you didn't subscribe to all of google's extra things right because i've had problems being a cheap person i don't subscribe to any of the cheap or any of the more expensive services and sometimes i have trouble it's like you can't play that because you're not a member of this Mm -hmm. even though i own that thing so yeah that's my question with the show also how good is it going to be at playing non like Google? Like how much of, of YouTube do you have to be into? I don't know. I'm not saying this well. Yeah, it's because YouTube is a is a in an interesting place because it's trying to be a music player and it does just fine as a music player if you're using it on a desktop. Mm-hmm. But once you get to mobile, once you get to like the assistant, these other platforms, then it only is really a music player that's worthwhile if you're subscribed to YouTube Red. Right. Yeah. That would be my main concern. Um, Google Assistant on the phone is getting a few new doodads. Um, the one that really caught my attention was that, like, for example, if you ask it to change the temperature in your it, on your, like, Nest thermostat, right, then not only will it obey that command, but it also will bring up the little kind of, like, three-quarters of a circle control wheel for for your thermostat so that if you you know want to further uh, you know tweak it you can do that by hand um which is really nice because then i don't have to go and hunt down the app right yeah uh and then they also they finished off talking about how google assistant is going to be more tightly integrated into android auto so being able to i think perform more hands-free actions um and I, I definitely have to reiterate that uh, I did my senior seminar analyzing several different um, like infotainment interfaces for uh, automobiles, and none of them are good enough. Don't use them. Pay attention to the road, people. There are bikers out there. <laughs> I was going to say that really cracks me up because you don't actually have a car. I do so. not have a car, but I do. You know, I do listen to podcasts while I'm biking, and I make sure that like I I 
don't interact with my phone while I'm moving, you know, right. I always pull over to the side before I like pull out my phone to, you know, do navigation stuff or whatever. Yep. Hello, dear listener. Uh, if you listen to a lot of podcasts, I know what you're probably thinking right now. Uh oh, this is a sponsor read, but it's not. We here at the Nexus don't have any sponsors, and we would like to avoid having to get sponsors because of the conflict of interest that it can introduce. See, any sponsors that would be likely to give us money are also entities that we would probably be covering here on the network. We want to be responsible to the listeners above all else. So what we are doing instead is we're asking you listeners for donations to help us to improve our shows. Now, the content that we that we're producing has been and always been released for free and it always will be. But you can voluntarily donate money through Patreon to the Nexus. The money will go towards improving the quality of the shows and, perhaps in the future, launching new shows. If you are interested in rewards, there are some pretty nifty ones up there. My favorite is The Fringe, which is a before and after, behind the scenes kind of show. And there's a few other cool things on there as well, including the opportunity to get your name shouted out as one of our biggest sponsors. So if you like the content that we're making here, if you find it useful and you want to help us make more of it, please go to patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Thank you. Uh, Google Photos. Surprisingly, there was one of the biggest cheers for a feature here. Wait for it. It's converting pictures of documents to PDF. Yeah, that's how you can tell that this was a developer conference. Uh (laughs) Everybody went wild (laughs) when they just said the letters PDF. Right. (laughs) Um, And they didn't even like specify whether this was like a a PDF that's fillable or anything like that, you know? It didn't seem like it was doing anything special like that. It's just literally taking, like, a picture that you've taken of a document and saving it as a PDF. Which I guess is a great feature, but... Yeah, I mean... Sure. If if a PDF doesn't have, like, selectable text, then to me it's just a JPEG. But, yes, but does it do that? That would be even... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they they didn't specify. At least, I, I think I was too busy typing to really be paying attention at that yeah. point. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, they also announced that you will be able to take old black and white photos and have Google Photos automatically apply color to them. And, uh, of course, you know, we'll have to see how well it does that. But uh, it sounds, sounds like a nice, nifty, you know... It, it, it depends on whether, like, what your preferences are. Do you like having them black and white or do you like having them color? Right. You know? I'm curious what assumption it makes about the colors because how would you know what the clothing colors are right. specifically? There's, yeah, and, and I mean, like, this is this is a an art form that has existed for a while, you know, taking black mm-hmm. and white photos and making them into color photos. And I don't know what techniques they use for, like, figuring out what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Can you take a grayscale screenshot of a of an Android phone <laughs> that is in, you know, its wind down mode and have it apply color to it again? This we'll find out. We will have to experiment with that when all this comes out. Yeah. <laughs> uh Google News. So this was one of the big things that was kind of talked about before the conference right you know everybody knew that okay google is going to be kind of <laughs> sorry ian just activated google somehow oh yeah you didn't well, even say hey google no i said okay oh i i did actually say the hot words oh, right. <laughs> in the correct order um what was i talking about you were talking news. about google news and yeah. people knowing that would... yeah so so we knew that they were going to be like winding down google play newsstand which was their like selling you magazine subscriptions thingy that nobody ever used and they're going to be rolling that back into the core google news app um and they're also revamping google news uh 
I'm not super familiar with what Google News looked like before this update, um, but it's gonna it's all materialized. That's good. It's, it's using Material Design. Um, it's going to be mixing together lots of different types of content. So, you know, traditionally, I think in Google News, you would expect to see a lot of written articles. Um, but now they're going to have written articles. They're going to have videos. They're going to have podcasts available. Um, I don't know how well podcasts are going to fit in there because, like, the podcasts that I'm used to listening to are, like, an hour long. And that's not going to, you know, that that, that is not the collection that you want to be spending an hour listening to something in, you know. Um, but there are, there definitely are like news based podcasts that are, you know, three minutes, 15 minutes long, you know, kind of thing. Um, much more reasonable. I'm not sure how this is going to be incorporated, but it's possible too, that basically they're having a timeline of news as well. So if you Mm -hmm. wanted to know about volcanoes erupting in Hawaii, they might have the most recent things, but also maybe down news articles from 10 years ago when it was really active Mm. and blah, blah, blah. So maybe if someone's scrolling down, you might assume they want to know more about it you might want to listen to an hour-long podcast about volcanoes in hawaii maybe yeah yeah um they're they're doing a lot to kind of tailor google news to you specifically you the reader um which i think yeah i mean that's been kind of a core part of google news for a really long time you know is like you can go and tweak your preferences for like i'm interested in politics i don't care about sports Mm -hmm. you know yada yada but it seems like google news is Using machine learning mm-hmm. to make a lot of those like inferences about you without you having to like specifically go and proactively set them ahead of time. Um, I am curious to like go and try and use Google News now because um, I de- I I it's been forever since I've opened it, but I definitely remember that like back in high school, I think I set specifically like Star Wars as an entire section in my Google <laughs> News interface That's precious yeah <laughs> i've been using it for a while now and i okay there's a difference between my habits and the person i wish i was okay okay so when i wish i read more about politics in certain times of the year i might be more interested in them but my habits are not necessarily to click on these articles mm-hmm. but it's the person i would want to be so I don't really want to make decisions entirely based off of my habits cuz they're not always good habits so this is like when you invite somebody to your house, right? You've got right. the the sitting room that has all like of the very classy, yeah, highbrow <laughs> books out, and so that's like what if you hand somebody your phone and yes. they open up Google News, that's what you want them to see is all the politics right. news and all, yeah. Or I to see be like, oh look at me who likes politics <laughs> but really doesn't. <laughs> or there's things sometimes if it bases it off of what you click on, like sometimes. Mm-hmm. This is not true, but the headline seems enough for me to like, oh, I know Mm. what's going on now because at least I can register that the volcanoes are erupting in Hawaii. I know that and that's all I really need to know. Yeah. But I don't know. And I do worry about it making decisions about what is important to people and places Mm -hmm. based on all that. I don't know. It, It makes me slightly worried about the moral decisions it's making. And what is important to the world or you mm-hmm. individually? I mean, to be fair, uh, I I don't think that news corporations themselves have been the greatest at choosing morally what should be important and what yes. people should be reading and watching, you know. Um, <clears throat> but that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> um, speaking of news corporations, actually, they are going to be emphasizing trusted news sources. And uh, I think this definitely ties into what you said at the very beginning of the Google News section when we were watching this is uh, Republicans are going to hate this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I feel like all of all of the, you know, Facebook and Google and all these tech companies uh, are getting a lot of flack for like, ah, you don't like conservative viewpoints, you know, and but it's like, okay, they're they're only coming at like publications that are literally spreading misinformation. Calm down. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. It, it, what is misinformation? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, th- th- that's the thing, is we want to be able to determine what is misinformation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, there was also recently, this wasn't announced at Google I.O., but there was a, a thing that YouTube announced recently where, um, like, they're going to start 
alongside conspiracy theory videos like popping up with like clips from wikipedia debunking what is being talked oh. about in the, <laughs> the videos flat earth conspirators Ex- you're really gonna hate this exactly yeah also republicans <laughs> so yeah uh they also talked about um a new thing called subscribe with google which is uh a way to kind of abstract away, you know, me having to go to like the New York Times, for example, and like giving them my credit card information and signing up for their subscription and stuff. You know, I can just, if I'm logged into my Google account, click one button, subscribe to it, boom, now I have access to it wherever I am logged into my Google account. Um, yay. I wonder if that makes it kind of use the new york times say as your preferred news source for stories it could yeah yeah um oh yeah and i i hadn't thought of it from that angle that like if the google news app can take into account can like use my credentials for showing me the stuff that i'm already paying for then that makes it infinitely more useful because like i think previously google news wouldn't do like without being aware of that you know, it might only be able to show me like two articles per month from, you know, right. or New York the Times. link will be there. But mm-hmm. then when you click on it, it will, I mean, you'd have to pay for it. So like, right. Would it then set maybe the New York Times as your top link and the Washington Post further down because it knows you don't have a subscription for Washington Post. Right. I don't know. It does frustrate me sometimes. I mean, you can read all of those in incognito mode, but um, still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or like save to pocket or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Yep. Uh, fun, fun stuff. Uh, speaking of the Google News app finally being available at, in Material Design, Google also is making it easier for third-party apps to third-party developers to make Material Design apps. Um, and this is something that, like, I've heard Ryan complaining about a lot. You know, because he has looked into like making like yeah making apps that use material design and he's like there there are no actual resources available for anybody to use you know like if i want to make one of those floating action buttons that has like you know kind of a gradient and a little bit of a drop shadow and stuff i have to make all of that stuff myself from scratch google doesn't give us any of that stuff they just you know have these um documents available that kind of give us guidelines on you know what it should look like in the final product um, but google is changing all of that today uh, if you go to material.io then you will find um, a theming tool which makes it very easy for you to kind of play around with like changing the color scheme uh in in your app you know um when i say you i'm referring to you a developer not you the you know an end user um and then um, Material Gallery is a, um, a related uh, product that makes it easier for designers to collaborate with each other on, you know, projects that they're doing, material design projects probably. So that's pretty nifty. It also has tools for different OSs as well. So mm, you can mm-hmm. use Material Design and iOS so your apps tend to look a little bit more the same across platforms. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a... A whole debate is like, Mm -hmm. should I have a similar look and feel across all of my different platforms or should I tailor it to the look and feel of each platform so that it feels like it fits in and, you know. um, Because I have an iPad at work and then I have my phone and it is sometimes annoying because the Goodreads app is completely different Mm -hmm. on the iPad versus my phone and it's somewhat frustrating. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, like the web is uh, you know, wild west, so like anything goes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh now Google Maps, one of the most beloved uh products from Google is getting a few new things. They uh are going to be Actually, I I kind of thought that they were already doing this, but maybe not. Um, Automatically adding like addresses and business listings to Google Maps based on Street View imagery. Because, yeah, they've already got all these cars going around taking pictures. So then they can kind of tell where businesses are based on, you know, the signage that's there because they have image recognitions or um, text recognition and images, uh, whatnot. Um, 
I wonder if this applies to houses as well, because sometimes it's inaccurate. Yeah. About yeah. what your house number and how that relates to the map. Oh, yeah. When I was in Morris, like, it was all over the place. It was terrible. Yeah. Um, they are adding, apparently, motorcycle directions as a new form of transportation. Um, and you texted a friend who rides a motorcycle and what what was their theory on what this could yeah, mean i asked on asked him what the difference would be really and he said i don't really know some states allow for lane splitting so maybe it would take that into consideration is and that's so that's where like two motorcyclists can ride side by side in no, one lane that's no. worse it's where a motorcycle can go between two cars so it's going down the lane oh sure i do that on my bike all the time yes <laughs> but it's illegal in some places and you're doing it illegally here <laughs> uh well okay i i do it way over on the right hand side so i'm splitting a lane between a car and a curb um oh no this is lane yeah. splitting between two cars yeah that sounds dangerous yeah i don't bad. i don't like that yeah um but yeah i can't i can't imagine how like turn by turn directions would have to be different in that case you know because like it's like google maps isn't going to be able to like look at all the cars around you and tell you like oh go through those in between those two cars um, it just knows what road you're on. Yeah. And, and unlike cycling, you know, like bicycles have a lot of kind of designated paths or like we have our own lanes right. kind of thing, you know, Places so it, they can go where mm -hmm. cars can't. Like yeah. Green so lane. it'll prioritize those when giving me directions, but like that doesn't apply to motorcycles. So I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe it just changes like the, the time estimate. No, I don't they know. They can go the same speed. Yeah, I don't know. None of this <sighs> makes sense. Not, yeah. We'll have to see. Um, they're adding a new tab to Google Maps, which is called For You. So it's going to be personal recommendations um, in particular. So like, like I think the idea here is that you tell it, like, here's a neighborhood that is of interest to me. Probably because I live there, right? Or I'm there all the time because I work there or something like that, right? And then it will be able to tell you, like, oh... Here are some new places that are opening in Frogtown, right? Here are some places that are trending that, you know, maybe you haven't been to before, but, like, lots of other people are going to that place. Um, I don't think this is going to be super useful for me personally because, like, I don't go out anyway. I mean, they could incorporate it with the other machine learning. It's like, you've been watching, watching a lot of cat videos and eating a lot of chocolate. Maybe you need some wine. This is a great wine bar for you. Or maybe what if there's a what if there's a new cat park opening? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you can take your cat here. Mm -hmm. Um, I do. I do really like uh the your match feature, which is going to be like um. So think about when you're browsing through Netflix, right? And Netflix tells you like, oh, this show is like a ninety five percent match for for you based on you know what we know of your preferences Except already. I resent that, and I feel like it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I trust the algorithm. So uh, Google Maps is going to be doing the same thing, but for businesses. Pretty cool. Um, and I, I I can't wait to see like what data points it's pulling from, you know, because it's like, d will it figure out that like, okay, Betsy cares a lot more about like how the food actually tastes at a place. And then will it figure out that like Ian cares a lot more about it just being cheap as heck? And <laughs> Yeah, does this only figure this out based on how often you go somewhere or if you actually review it i don't know i th i think it it does definitely take into account reviews that you've left for places yeah yeah if you're not a frequent reviewer which exactly. i'm guessing a small percentage of the google maps right. users actually review right. maybe this is maybe this is like a sneaky way for them to just like encourage people to put more reviews on google maps yeah that seems like the most likely scenario. I mm -hmm. wonder if it has a filter for asshole reviewers who are always like, the service was terrible. <laughs> just never go anywhere. Yeah, they'll people. just yeah. stay home. If, yeah, if, if you're somebody who doesn't like anywhere, then <laughs> nothing will show up for you. <laughs> As I a had match. to send back my cheese sandwich because it was too melty. It was too cheesy. <laughs> it had the cheese yeah. underneath the patty instead of on yes. top of the patty. By, Don't go here. By the way, Sundar opened the keynote by talking about the biggest mistake that Google made in 2017, which is apparently putting the cheese on the bottom in the cheeseburger emoji. Well, it was wrong. I mean, I'm not one who went up in arms totally about it, yeah. but I felt like someone should have caught that. I mean, it, okay. It didn't make sense with physics, Ian. I can put the cheese wherever I want to in yeah, my cheeseburger. Yeah, but it wouldn't melt nicely oh, over the okay, bun. Oh, okay, 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 yeah. Um, 
You know what what thing Google actually did get wrong in an emoji one time that nobody made a big deal about was the like little devil emoji that was supposed to be smiling was frowning in one version of of Android. And so one time my girlfriend sent me a frowning uh you know like a, a, an angry devil and i saw a happy devil because i was on the newer version of android that had the correct version oh. and i was like you're so happy and she was like no you know what if would be really smart to use machine learning for is to show you what the emoji would look like on the other person's phone for mm. your contact because i never know when i'm texting someone that's using an ios phone right right because we once texted each other back and forth during a lunch meeting. Not you and I, but some of my friends. Mm-hmm. We basically text each other emojis and we're like, what the hell? I texted you that? <laughs> so I feel like Google, take note. This would be a good mm-hmm. application of your machine learning. There you go. Um, I, I really, really like this next one. Uh, integrating the camera into walking directions. Um, so the example that they gave here is like, all right, you come out of a subway and you look around and you don't know which way to go because you don't know which way is north because, like, you know, you've you been underground. You don't know which way is north. Exactly. Or sometimes it's not oriented. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're looking at the screen and, like, the little yeah. blue indicator is – yeah, yeah. Um, and and so now what they're going to be doing is they're they're allowing you to kind of just point the camera at the stuff around you and it will match that up with what it has already seen from, like, street view imagery, right, and go, okay – you're pointing east right now. Go right. Yep. And then um and then it will, you know, kind of like overlay the like blue dotted directions for walking on your screen as you're looking at stuff. So it's getting into augmented reality as well. Um the and and they've they're also doing some like proper augmented reality stuff where um you can point your your camera around and it will like show you business listings for places you know like right there on the building kind of thing um what you know what the rating is what you know what they're famous for whatever and stuff like that um and then they also (laughs) they talked about they they seemed kind of hesitant about this one like we're not sure if this is going to be a feature yet or not um but they had like a little uh like 3D modeled fox that was like walking around in front of the person as kind of like their guide and it looked very much like the fox that pops up the first time that you use Google cardboard you know mm-hmm. when you're in that tutorial um i don't know i wouldn't mind that i think it seemed kind of cute yeah it's it wouldn't bother me yeah it's not like i saw that feature and was like yes please yeah no pretty N- please not the way that like google duplex i was like yes please but don't call it that <laughs> yeah <laughs> um google lens is getting a few new things so i didn't really realize that google lens still hadn't rolled out to a lot of other devices properly because you know having a pixel phone i just you know was, like it's there it's always been there Yay. Um, But uh, Lens is going to be rolling out into directly in the camera app on a bunch of third party phones. And once again, they had like, you know, they flashed a bunch of logos up there of like the companies that make these phones. Um, And uh, and that's pretty huge because Lens has been available in our camera app on the Pixel phones for a while. Have you used it? Now that I'm saying that, I can't think of many times that I've used it. Um, only a few random times just to see if it worked. Like mm-hmm. Once I pointed it at my dog and it actually knew what breed it was. I think I always try to use it on QR codes. Yeah. Yeah. That's mainly what I use it for. And I don't encounter QR codes very often. Yeah. Um. They're using machine learning, surprisingly, though, to improve it so that if you do <laughs> see objects, it will make suggestions for you based on these objects like hey i really like this style in the store and it's like Mm, hey mm -hmm. here are other things that would match that thing so if you're completely inept at dressing yourself hello that's me ian you can test this out for us and i will (laughs) ask your students to rate (laughs) to rate you and see whether or not they feel like you're better dressed Uh, that's my challenge I think i think that savannah would be a better person to ask about you know how i'm dressing (laughs) yeah um they also google lens is going to be able to recognize words now and when they announced that i was like wait how could it not do that already it was very confusing to me also because they've been able to do this in google translate for a really Mm -hmm. long time Mm -hmm. so why that wasn't incorporated into google lens i don't know yeah yeah 
And uh, I mean, if Google Photos can make PDFs out of things, <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, and then they finished off by talking about their self-driving cars, um, which falls under the Waymo umbrella instead of the Google umbrella. And I thought that this section of the presentation was almost unnecessary because like most of what they talked about on stage was like, here's all of the challenges that right. we've had to overcome in order to like make Google self-driving cars work. And I'm like, I, I know. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily new information aside from the fact that I was super excited that they figured out how to drive in snow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, yeah, it was really cool seeing their kind of like, um, visualization of like, this is, this is what the sensors see with all of the raw input and it was just like just like an entire sea of like green in front of of this car because like there's just particles everywhere and it you know it's just detecting stuff all over the place and then through the magic of machine learning uh -huh, we're able to filter through all that noise to find the actual nuggets you know of like what the the car needs to know about and boom look at this it's detecting the four parked cars that are on this street Good stuff. It's possible they tacked this on partly because of the recent news that Uber did mm. indeed hit a pedestrian mm -hmm. on a bike. So people may have been wondering, yeah. is Google really doing any better? And their answer here was, why, yes, we are. And they, let's see, so they talked about one of their programs that's going on in Phoenix, Arizona right now. The Uber incident happened in Arizona as well, right? Was that, I think so. Was that in Phoenix? I don't know. I don't know I don't which know. city, but it... Yeah. Um I yeah, I thought it was very interesting that they didn't address it at all. I think they you know? didn't address it, but they did. They didn't address and accuse Uber of anything, but they basically said we can see someone on a bike. Mm. That was one of their examples. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um and we won't hit them, unlike Uber. That was implied. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It di it didn't seem as heavy-handed to me as as you're making it sound. No, but, but... I, I mean they they're not going to they're too classy for that. Sure. Right. Google being classy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, they did talk about kind of like the specific program that they've been running in Phoenix, Arizona. They've had uh, a few like early riders uh, getting to try out these Waymo uh, self-driven cars. And like this isn't like, you know, all right. We've got this like pool of people and like every once in a while we'll let them like use the car. I, I got the feeling that this was literally like, hey, family, take this car. This is now like the car that you use all the time, um, which is like, man, I would love to be part of that program. I know. If they want to <laughs> test out snow, I mean, come up. Here come we up go. to Minnesota. We, we've got a little bit of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it sticks around until like April. Right. Yeah. So lots of lots of snow. Yeah. Lo lots of testing opportunities. Do you want to know if it can drive in a blizzard? Drive in Minnesota. <laughs> Do you want to know if it'll drive in snow plus rain plus ice? Drive in Minnesota. Do you want to know how it will do sharing the road with bikers? Definitely drive it in <laughs> Minnesota, specifically Minneapolis. Right. Everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, then um, they announced that soon anyone in the city of Phoenix will be able to call for a ride so from Uber. Waymo. Yeah, and I like I I didn't hear them talk about like pricing or anything. I don't know if they're charging people for this. I don't know what like what are the details. Give me the deets. I don't. Yeah, this was not good news for Uber. No, not well, in the wake of them hitting someone. Yeah, and then I like, mean, this hey. is literally like Uber's end goal. Right, is it's to cut the middleman out. Literally, be this service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, they're still not profitable. So the only way mm. they'll be profitable is they can get to the point that Google is right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if the Google race is cuts on. them off at the knees, then they're screwed. Yeah. So that was um, that was all the major announcements that they had for us at Google I.O. Nothing um, about Wear OS. No. Nope. That was disappointing. No. Nope. Um, nothing about Chromebooks or anything like that. Uh, and as usual, nothing about hardware, but that was to be expected. Right. Yeah. All their hardware announcements are going to be in the fall. Um, I mean, they did have the Google Assistant uh, thingies with the screens here. Um, I forget what those are called already. But, yeah. Totally not the show. The, oh, that's... Yeah, right, right, right. And, the, <laughs> and probably not Android something. Yeah, no. Um, it, was, it was pretty entertaining watching this in the teacher's lounge at a high school, you know, 
and like other people coming in and out and going like, oh, what are you guys watching? Are you watching the Windows something something? (laughs) Why no, we're not. (laughs) And well, to be fair, Microsoft Build Conference is literally like in its second day right now. So that is going on. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Um. And uh, I guess I would I would like to leave us with uh, what they what they told us at the end of the keynote. Make good things together. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice sentiment. It is. So in the spirit of making nice things together, Betsy, where can people find you on the internet? Um, you can't really find me very much on the internet. I mostly use Twitter to complain. Mm. To CenturyLink mostly. <laughs> <laughs> hey. What if Google came out with a service that could complain <laughs> at companies you? for you? Yeah, if they noticed that my my Wi-Fi was slow on my phone and then pinged CenturyLink for me, I would love that. That'd be perfect. Have fun talking to their chat, because I sure do. <laughs> uh, and I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, or you can uh, take a look at ianrbuck.com for links to other stuff that I make. Uh, this episode of the next special is released under a creative commons attribution license so feel free to take any part of it and use it in any way that you like as long as you link back to the nexus.tv slash ns58 uh we have a brand new subreddit dedicated to the nexus uh so that is the the uh, official comment section for all of our episodes so if you want to discuss this episode with uh with other people then go and check out reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv uh and remember that no matter how you're listening to this you should definitely go and subscribe to nexus special in your favorite podcast player so you can get new episodes as soon as they come out thanks for listening everybody have a good one